Aloha, everyone. Aloha. Good to see so many of you here for the very first Hawaii Cloud Innovation Summit. I'm Leilani Farinas, Executive Director of True. I'm so excited to welcome all of you. Aloha, everyone. I'm Christine Sakuda, the Executive Director of Transform Hawaii Government. True and THG are glad to present this first Cloud Innovation Summit in Hawaii. Leilani and I will be serving as your MCs today and welcome again. We believe this is the perfect timing for today's summit on cloud innovation. The world is rapidly changing, technology is evolving, and Hawaii is poised to evolve along with the rest of the world. For those of you who may not be familiar with True, let me take a moment to tell you more about us. Our mission is to accelerate the adoption of technology in Hawaii. By leveraging technology, our, com our community can learn new skills, increase productivity, and improve efficiencies. We want to see local organizations succeed, create a mo more diversified and sustainable economy for our island home, and have a workforce that earns higher income so they can live here in Hawaii. And I'd like to tell you briefly about Transform Hawaii Government. We are a nonprofit organization that partners with government leaders to modernize state government in order to support a vibrant Hawaii. We believe government modernization helps to streamline processes, create more efficiency, reduce redundancy, and eliminate silos. We believe modernization provides data and other information that is critical for public policy and helps create more transparency and trust. And that's why we are glad to be a part of the summit today. This summit would not have been possible with the, without the support of our corporate sponsors, Data House and Amazon Web Services. We would like to give our sponsors an opportunity to say a few words. We'll start with Eddie Antai, president of Data House. Please welcome Eddie with me. Thanks, Lilani. Wow, look at this. Uh, I'm just so thrilled to see so many of you here today and eager to hear and learn how other parts of the world are innovating by leveraging cloud technologies. And we at Data House are sincerely privileged to be a corporate sponsor for this first ever Cloud Innovation Summit in Hawaii. This couldn't have been a more fitting um, event that aligns perfectly with our company's purpose, which is to be a leader advancing our communities through smart innovation and collaboration for a better future. So it was a no-brainer for us to help make this dream become a reality. For those that aren't familiar with Data House, um, we're proud to be made from Hawaii, doing business for nearly 50 years. I can confidently say that we've partnered with almost every organization and major uh, government agency in, this agency in the state, helping them advance their business and organizations with technology. But what excites us as a local business these days is really fulfilling our mission to provide world-class services outside of our island state, which helps us to right-size this perpetual imbalance of trade. And I'm gonna give credit to my colleague, Clyde Shiege, that's out here that made that <laughs> statement. Um, but it's really about exporting our professional services outside of Hawaii so we can continually hire more local talent and sustain our business, what, which ultimately contributes to the overall health of our economy. But it does take great talent and great culture. I'm humbled to say that we're lucky to have both so if you get a chance and you see folks wearing the Data House uh, t-shirts or shirts, please feel free to talk story with them, with any of them, um, and you'll be thrilled to get to know them. Again, we mahalo you for investing your time today, and we hope you walk away inspired and equipped to change your future. Mahalo. Mahalo, Eddie. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our other corporate sponsor, Amazon Web Services. With us this morning is Kim Majeros, Vice President of State and Local Government and Education of AWS. Please give Kim a warm welcome. Well, good morning, and it's exciting to see many of you who have decided to come spend the day with us. Um, again, mahalo, aloha, and it's probably taken me about close to 40 years to get that perfected. I love 
the state, I love the culture, and I love everything that it has to offer. Um, I'm very proud to be a part of the AWS state and local and education business. I also have responsibility for all the organizations that are true to that mission. So when you think about the ed techs and the gov techs that are truly out there to support the mission, um, I'm excited to have them a part of our remit because it keeps us close to um, the needs of what the state and educators are looking for. Um, my organization is vast. You'll hear from several of the leaders that are here today. I know it was a tough ask to get them to come. Uh, so I appreciate uh, all my AWS peers that are here. Thank you for your commitment to really focus on solving some of the challenges that we know and hear from our customers. Um, when we think about the mission to the cloud, it really starts with your mission and understanding the direction and the vision that you have that you want to innovate to and for. And I'm hoping that as you spend the course of the day listening to some of the key speakers um, in some of the breakout sessions, you get to see and understand how that journey starts, but more importantly, how it will be focused in what you're trying to solve for from your mission. Um, it's funny, when I think about the time that we've spent as AWS, public sector started in 2010. So it feels like it should have been longer, but it's not. It's only a, a quick 12 years ago. But ironically, the state and local government business actually started in 2017. That's when I joined. And the evolution and the opportunity has only been accelerated through probably one of the most historic events that many of us will have experienced. So when you think about this, the citizen needs through health and human services, access to information, access to pandemic unemployment, when we think about the innovation that many states had gone through, we learned so much. But I think it also is back to the ethos of AWS and how we do our business. We are bizarrely attached to long-term commitments. This is about a long-term partnership and a relationship because as we learn, we will innovate with you, we will innovate for you, because that is how AWS operates. 90% of all services built by AWS is really from the voice of the customer. And I think you'll see that as you go through the course of the day and you hear the stories. We didn't start with, hey, this is what we have. Go ahead, it's yours. It really started with, what problem statement do you have? and how do we help you achieve a solution for that problem statement? You'll hear about some of that. Um, and ironically, as much as 90% is, is hearing from you and helping us guide our services, that last piece is also us trying to look around corners for you. So when you think about the value of the cloud and the partnership with AWS, not only are we learning from you, but we're trying to go forward with you and hopefully a little bit quicker to help you go faster. Um, ironically, as the state of Hawaii and many states, we keep talking about employment. We talk about skills. And if you look at the World Economic Forum, they say that by 2025, 50% of the workforce today has to be upskilled or reskilled. I was having a quick little chat with uh, some colleagues at the other table. And the interesting piece is we have to help you find that talent. You're going to hear from our training and certification organization today, where Jenny is going to help you articulate that investment and that, in, that empowerment that she could help enable the organizations. But also, I want to point out what we're doing, because I think it's a joint responsibility between us as AWS and our commercial organizations, our education institutions, and our government to help you not only identify, but upskill, reskill, and find that talent so that you can innovate faster. Because truly, the technology could actually be the easiest part. It's the change management, and more importantly, it's the commitment from the top to go faster. As business transform across every industry, driven by cloud technologies, um, we're redefining how and what people need to be hired. So I want all of you to recognize that we hear you. And in order to find that talent, we will invest with you, with the education institutions. And more importantly, we're going to start younger. We have to start younger to capture the minds of these young kids that are actually probably a little bit more advanced than some of us in the way they use their technology today. But we're going to continue to grow and invest in them so that as they leave 12th grade, as they're 
walking into the community college or the university systems here, the important part is, is you will have that talent ready so that the next generation can pick off where others have left off so that they can innovate and make the citizen engagement and more importantly, a vibrant work environment. Now you're gonna hear a lot about public sector stories. Um, I think everyone here has to recognize who you are and where we are. We are all students. We will all continue to learn, but we're all citizens. And some of us wish we were citizens of Hawaii, but we'll leave that one alone for a second. The important part I want you all to understand is that you are a voice to your government, and it's important whether you're a parent to a student or you are a citizen exchanging with the state, you can help drive the transformation that we know the state needs. Um, I'm going to give you a couple quick examples of some commercial transformations. For example, Capital One exited eight of their on-prem data centers by migrating to AWS. They are transforming their actual customer experience, because that's really what it comes down to. Is it easy? Can I, is it convenient? Can I get to it? Is it delivering the, all the services that I need? But Capital One's digital bank is an all-in on AWS and embraces data analytics, microservices, AI, ML, and other solutions that allow them to continue to innovate based on customer feedback. And earlier this month, for those of you who are Delta friends or enjoy their Delta miles, um, AWS actually announced a multi-year agreement with Delta to serve as the airline's preferred cloud vendor. AWS will help De Delta unlock technologies streamline processes and make the customer experience faster, smoother, and more secure. And I'm confident that many of those people traveling from the Atlanta area or the south or the north or the east, they are excited to jump on Delta to come to this amazing place. I'll close with this. AWS is committed to training. Again, you'll hear from Jenny a little bit later, but what I want everyone else to understand is they that we are committed to training 29 million people for free by 2025. That is available to everybody here. You have access to content, data, online learning to help support your journey and your knowledge base. It all starts with one, and that is learn and be curious. Be curious about how AWS can help support you. Learn how the partnership that we have with our partner, Data House, can help you accelerate your transformation. But more importantly, it all starts with you. Learn and be curious, be committed to the mission and to the change, and we look forward to supporting you along the way. And again, thank you for coming. Mahalo, and uh, enjoy the day. Thank you. Mahalo, Kim, for being with us. We appreciate the support of the AWS team. We would also like to thank the Hawaii Tourism Authority for supporting our event here at the Convention Center and Pacific Business News, our media sponsor, our, our, our media partner for this inaugural summit. I'm sure many of you learned about this summit from reading PBN. A big mahalo again to HTA and PBN. Now, we'd like to start today's summit off with a very entertaining three-minute video from AWS in Indonesia. We think you'll enjoy the very relatable explanation of cloud technology with the English subtitles. Let's watch it now. Tapi memang kamu kerja di situ kan, Dit? Yang pencet-pencet. Aplikasi, iya itu salah satu kerjaan Adit memang untuk bikin aplikasi di internet. Dari dulu kakek pengen tahu internet itu apa sih? Internet itu. Hmm. Kamu aja nggak tahu internet itu apa nih? Udahlah. <tuh> Kemarin kan Adit belum bisa jawab pertanyaan kakek soal internet. Nah, di dalam kamar ini, 
Adit udah buat sesuatu untuk menjawab pertanyaan kakek. Penasaran? Adit persembahkan. Internet. Internet itu adalah jaringan komputer-komputer yang saling terhubung. Internet itu kayak laptop Adit, komputer kakek, dan handphone kita ini, ini juga komputer kayak. Di sisi perusahaan, komputer mereka jauh lebih besar dan lebih kuat kayak. Mereka ini disebutnya server. Nah, server-server dan proses perhitungan komputer yang terjadi di sini, itu yang dinamakan Cloud Computing atau komputasi awan. Misalnya kemarin nih kayak Adit pesen tiket kereta. Informasi pesanan tiket Adit ini dikirim dari HP Adit dan jalan tuh kayak melalui wifi, melalui kabel-kabel, melalui satelit, terus jalan sampai ke server perusahaan tiket. Nah, server perusahaan tiket tadi ngobrol dengan server perusahaan kereta api. Ada nggak kursi buat Adit? Oh, ada nih. Nah, jawaban ini akan dikirim lagi ke server perusahaan tiket, baru dikirim ke Adi. Lalu kan Adit bayar ke server bank. Nah, server bank ngobrol dengan server perusahaan tiket. Ini baru satu Adit, kek. Misalkan ini data nih, kek. Bayangkan ada miliaran orang, ada yang pesan tiket, pesan obat online, belanja online, ada yang nonton streaming, kek. Dan karena semua data hilir mudik ini nggak terlihat, terus seakan-akan mereka naik aja gitu ke langit. Makanya sekarang bentuknya udah kayak apa, kek? Kayak awan. Makanya disebut cloud computing. Ah, itu apa? Nah, kalau ini namanya data center. Karena permintaan data hilir mudik ini semakin banyak dan semakin rumit, makanya perusahaan-perusahaan ini membutuhkan server-server yang jauh lebih besar dan lebih kuat. Seperti yang dimiliki data center perusahaan tempat adik bekerja, AWS. Di AWS, proses cloud computing bisa jadi jauh lebih cepat, lebih canggih, lebih aman, dan kapasitasnya jauh lebih besar. Mereka itu punya data center di 25 lokasi di seluruh dunia. Kakek bangga betul sama kamu. Itu awannya bagus banget. Ya, itu dari bantalnya kakek. Bantalnya mana? Wasn't that an inspirational video? Feel free to use your cotton stuffing from your pillow to explain cloud, cloud computing to others. We've invited great speakers who have been leading the way to leverage cloud technology. Please refer to the detailed agenda in your bag. Also, your feedback on our sessions is important to us. Please take the time to take a quick survey at the end of each session via QR code. Our first keynote presentation focuses on post-pandemic recovery. COVID-19 impacted all of us in business, government, and the nonprofit organizations. Kat Lawrence, Medicaid lead for AWS, was scheduled to be here for this session, but unfortunately, she was un there was an unexpected death in her family and she could not join us. Our hearts and thoughts are with Kat and her family. Fortunately, Someone who also has extensive understanding of Medicaid was able to fill in for Kat. Her AWS colleague, Casey Burns, and joining him will be Morgan Reed. Let me share a little bit about Casey. He leads the AWS state and local vertical and strategy teams. He previously led the US state and local and health and human services team helping states to use technology to solve their toughest challenges. Casey is an experienced private and public sector executive with a background in health, healthcare, technology, and organizational transformation. Joining Casey, we have Morgan Reed, executive government advisor who is with AWS's state and local government division. Morgan spent four years as the Chief Information Officer for the State of Arizona, where he led cloud transformations to consolidate 30 different email systems, modernize 15 citizen-facing applications, migrate critical agency workloads off the state-owned main mainframe, and shut down the state's largest data center after migrating 80% to the cloud. Today, 
Morgan coaches state and local government executives through strategy, policy, and governance challenges and helps them accelerate their cloud adoption journey. Please join me in welcoming our two speakers. Can we see the slides? Good morning, everybody. Uh, if I can get slides working. Ah, pleasure. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, someone asked me this morning if I got the memo on uh, business casual in Hawaii. I did. I didn't kind of believe it. It's amazing. I wish I had. Uh, so thank you for uh, uh, just this enormous welcome and giving us the opportunity to talk. Um, so I'm Casey Burns. I lead the state and local verticals team at AWS. And what does that mean? Um, we realized at AWS under Kim a while ago, uh, cloud is a really transformational technology and to have, but it's a business transformation we're, we're going. It's not just a technology transformation. So we should actually bring in some people who have led transformations in the business of government and put them inside AWS. So for five years, I led the Health and Human Services organization. And we did some really cool stuff, right? Bring the first ever Medicaid systems onto AWS, the first eligibility platforms. And now I have a responsibility not for just for the health and human services team, but also our transportation team, our justice and public safety, um, our finance and administration. Teams composed of people who have been in and led major transformations in government. And uh, believe it or not, who's one of uh, their primary jobs is to have conversations like this and say, I have done it and you can too. Um, I did not expect that to be one of the primary things our team did, but it is, um, right? Is saying, this is, we have done this, we can show you the way. Um, or actually, we can show you parts of the way because the way you are going to do this is certainly different than the way we had to do this. Um, a little bit about me to fill in, which is just, um, I've been in and around government for 15 years working at the intersection of tech and policy. I come from a policy background, um, but notably I spent uh, a year in the White House um, during the Obama administration uh, working unexpectedly on the policy response to healthcare.gov. Um, that was not the job I went there to do, but three weeks after arriving at my desk in the White House, which actually we say the White House, the White House is three buildings and has 7,000 people in it. We were like, oh, did you? No, I, I could not see the West Wing from my desk. I could not do any of that from my desk, right? Um, uh, right, healthcare.gov collapse. And I would spend the next year I would, in really what I think of as the capstone and the culmination of the work I did in government, which was to try to bring in uh, uh, better technology practices that have really been established in large technology companies and other leading companies and bring those into government. And that is not to be a disservice to anyone who is in government doing great work. The government is full of absolutely amazing, talented policy folks, but over the years had disinvested and not spent enough time and effort in really thinking through how do we execute large technology projects. And really our thesis, and I think it's true, is we'd gotten so, we were so bad at doing technology, we couldn't even buy technology anymore. So we were trying to bring in better uh, outside folks to put, or better, different set of skills from outside, right? Product managers, engineers, UX, right? And then marry them with the amazing and talented people within government. It's largely been a successful effort on the federal side, right? Um, and if you've heard of the United States Digital Service and 18F, two organizations that are really leading the way in how we do this uh, in the federal side, um, right? That's starting to spread out into state and local, but I think unfortunately we still have a longer way to go um, from uh, uh, the state and city perspective. Um, the original ask for this presentation, well, it wasn't to me, it was to a colleague, unfortunately, um, who can't be here, but was to talk about how, what does it mean? How do we make government uh, uh, its best? And I have a really, really simple definition for this, and I kind of think it's a low bar, except it keeps not, which is government at its best, it works. It's there, it's reliable when you need it, it's available, it's easy to interact with, it's painless, it's friction-free. And if I just described your experience in interacting with government, we should talk, because I'd be impressed. 
Uh, but as a rule, there are po amazing pockets of this goodness going on everywhere. I think as a rule, right, this is not what government has been set up to do. It's not what we're optimized for, and it's time to change that. It's unacceptable. Uh, I'm going to use a study that probably uh, most people remember, um, and I'm not going to pick on our friends um, who ran unemployment programs, but just this is such a vivid example that we all remember that we're all exposed to. I will say there is nothing unique about uh, the experience that uh, um, of, excuse me, operating uninsur uh, unemployment insurance programs during the pandemic. All of these deficient, all the things that made this hard are endemic. They're in government all the time, right? COVID made this worse. The massive increase in demand made this worse, but there are small tragedies, medium-sized tragedies, and large tragedies all the time in terms of uh, policymakers, administrators not being able to execute on what they're trying to do because the technology isn't there. This is just an incredibly vivid example. So if you remember, and I suspect some of you do, um, right, we went from about three, almost 4% unemployment uh, in early 2020 to about 15%, more or less in a month, right? What did that do? Uh, some people who were suddenly unemployed started to submit unemployment insurance applications, right? How bad did it get? Well, all over the country, unemployment insurance systems started to collapse. Um, uh, call centers were deluged. You could, if you were lucky, you got a, uh, uh, a message that said, we are busy. Uh, oftentimes people just got a busy tone. People in the call centers couldn't even tell how many calls they were getting per day because they had no way to do that. But typically, we would see an organization set up to do 75, 100 concurrent calls, and suddenly they were getting 40, 50, 60,000 calls a day. However, many programs couldn't tell you that because you weren't, they weren't even able to collect the data on call volume. If you can't collect the data on call volume, you most certainly can't connect, collect the data on what are people calling about, right? What do they need? How, how can we help them, right? This got so bad at some point, <laughs> I'm not gonna single out any real states throughout this except this one because it's just too funny not to. This was the state of Nevada who took to Twitter to let people know that their UI application system was not down, it was just going very slow, right? I think you functionally lost the battle. If you cannot apply for a benefit because it's so slow, I think the nuance is lost, right? That, uh, right, no, oh, it's, it's up. If you need Twitter to let people know that, come on. Uh, but. Thank you. All across the country, this was endemic. This is happening everywhere. And it's not unique to this, right? I'm going to bring you back to this graph. And just as a reminder, nothing like this had ever happened before, right? This was totally unprecedented, right? This was a black swan, which if you remember 2008, we talked about black swans a lot. And someone told me they not everybody got this concept anymore, so I'm sorry if you don't, but the black swan was this notion that this risk simply could not be anticipated ahead of time, right? It came out of nowhere. The probability was hard to gauge. The consequences were enormous, right? And we just couldn't see it coming, but if you look back in hindsight, oh, maybe we could have. This whole notion is based on the fact that for a long time, no European had seen a black swan, right? And then they got, folks got to Australia, lo and behold, black swans, right? So they existed, you just didn't have a way to know about this. Was this a black swan though? <sighs> no, right? By no means is an increased demand or increased use of a program, like these things happen all the time in our collective memory we choose to forget, right? Um, that we free face trying circumstances sort of all the time. Um, <laughs> And I actually used this, I stole it from uh, another person's presentation. He was using it to make a point that actually this was this approach where people got in a line and applied with paper was actually better than applying online during COVID because at least you knew where your application was. You'd handed it to the person. Could we have anticipated this? Yeah, this is a 50 year look at unemployment data. And what you will take away from this is that earlier I was lying with statistics, right? Uh, if you cut off the graph, this looks unprecedented, but basically every 10 years, there's a mass unemployment event, right? 15 years. It doesn't matter where you are, right? We all, our programs need to be designed with the flexibility and the capability to surge, to encounter unexpected things. You might not get a three or five X overnight increase 
in your demand for services, but most certainly you're gonna to have to implement a new program. You're gonna change a program design. You're gonna decide on a new way to implement something, right? And you can't do it unless your systems are designed to change and to accommodate that sort of thing. So are we doing that right now? I think the results from COVID say no, right, very vividly. I do think, and I really wanna highlight um, the things we learned during COVID, and a lot of these are not new, right, a lot, but I think we can all just say we agree on them now. Some of these before were controversial, um, right? You're bad at weighing the risk in your existing programs. The status quo was the riskiest approach in all of these programs. No one thought that their applications were gonna fail when more people use them, and they did, right? Uh, uh, and the states that were most successful in responding to this basically said, we cannot do this the way we would normally do it. The status quo is how we got into this mess. We need to try something new, right? An important piece in that was a lot of things that were nice to have before, right? Moving to more uh, fully online experiences, automating workflows, giving workers better tools, use embracing chatbots, using you, uh, uh, user experience design, doing user research. We're nice to have, that's cute. Like, we'll do that later, not a priority. I have servers to upgrade, or I have a mainframe, but migration to do. These became must-haves during the pandemic. If you could not effectively move people through a workflow, your application is going to fail. It will. If you, the majority of the people who are in your call center are answering questions like, what is the status of someone's benefit application? Right, where do I stand in the process? Again, you are failing. Like, that is a very simple thing to answer. We know folks, right, they don't want to call a call center to get a status update. They will take that in whatever form imaginable, but if they can't get it someone else, they're gonna call your call center six, eight, 10, 12 times a day until they can get an answer or not, and they're gonna start calling again the next day, which is what we saw again and again, uh, right? Expectations have been increased over the past 10 years. There's no longer the like, oh, right, we can't deliver great services. The bar is the leading private sector companies. It doesn't matter if you are running you know, a small nonprofit it does, you know, or a government agency, right? People expect better. Uh, government can also be fast. We saw amazingly fast things happen throughout the pandemic. People put up new websites, people put up new call centers, people stood up new analytics projects. We, these are things we can't forget, right? Mm -hmm things that would have been hard and taken months and years, um, right, took days, weeks, uh, not months, quarters, years. Um, we're not getting more eligibility workers. We're not getting more case workers. They're highly trained, they're highly specialized. They're gonna start retiring soon, right? We can't onboard them fast enough. And frankly, we're making them do low value work right now. And we saw that again and again. You should not be right, answering a call to reset a PIN if you are a 30-year trained and experienced eligibility worker. You should be working on the most important, highest touch activity with the hardest case imaginable, right? And we see this in, I don't care what kind of program it is, that we are doing a poor job of splitting the work um, and making sure that the most able people are answering the hardest questions and that frankly that like humans aren't doing activities the machines should do. And the, thing, the question around automation, specialized programs is, oh, we're gonna lay off people. And I think, no, the workload, right? We need machines to do work that machines can do moving forward so that humans can do the highest touch, highest value work, right? I don't think that's controversial anymore, it shouldn't be. And the last is, you can do a lot of technology work and if you don't do it better than we're doing it or had been doing it, it still won't work very well. You have to embrace the modern approaches. Uh, cloud itself is as much a mindset and a way to think about doing tech as it is a technology in itself. All right, cute, Casey, love it. A lot of platitudes. Did anybody actually do anything with this? Um, I'm gonna tell you the story of another very tiny state, uh, Rhode Island. Um, Rhode Island, one of the smallest states, um, right? Their unemployment rate effectively overnight went even higher than the national average, uh, went to about 17%. Um, right? And they had an amazing leader at the time who was one of the only people we saw step back and say, if I do this the way we, right, we would normally, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Right? It does not seem like the status quo approach is working anywhere else. 
Right? He took a step back um, and basically said, how do we do this in a different way? And we really worked with AWS not to think about what system should we launch, what should we do anything, but really to sit around a table and start to do, use something called our, the working backwards process, which is Amazon's way of doing we're not supposed to say this, sorry. Uh, or it's, it's an implementation effectively of user-centered design, right? Um, right, and making it a business process. And over time, people have said, can we use the methods that Amazon have used? Um, and we have actually now offered this and used this with uh, a number of agencies. Uh, this organization started using that and really said, okay, first thing, most important thing, we're gonna get a huge increase in a new type of application. How do we handle that? Right? And then how do we respond to the deluge of calls that we're gonna get around all of this? And then, oh my God, somewhat unique in unemployment insurance is that people have to recertify. So every two weeks, you have to re-engage with the program and say, hey, you are still looking, looking for work. Um, or you're not employed. Um, right, daily. So he's, right, the first thing they did was stand up a brand new application. Again, in less than two weeks to handle all of the new applications so that they would not feed them through the mainframe, right? Uh, thoroughly modern. And this is an approach we probably would have recommended anywhere, is set up a new application, do it very quickly, and then feed those through your benefit system, uh, your, uh, right, when you have the chance. Did you see that happen in many spots? You did not, right? You saw lots of systems fail because they kept using the existing workflow and kept trying to push it through a system that was overwhelmed. That's a failure in technical leadership. For me, not a systems failure. We could have seen that coming. There was ways to not do that, uh, but we saw that again and again. Uh, Rhode Island didn't do that, right? They solved that, they moved on to the next problem. The next problem was, oh my God, people are gonna call. We can answer 75 calls at once. We need some new capacity to do that. Stood up a brand new cloud call center, right, to give excess capacity and also let their agents work from home. Most importantly, call center is one of, if not the most important interaction points between uh, uh, beneficiaries, citizens, because there's people interacting with your programs, right? And it's a great way to get data and to understand what people need, and more importantly, what things you need to fix next. Uh, one of the things that needed to get fixed is that a lot of people are calling to reset pins, right? Reset a password effectively. Is that a good use of that, right? Highly specialized caseworkers' time? It's not, right? Um, actually, I'm gonna. The most frequent things people were calling for, uh, right? What's the status of my application? When will I get my benefits? How much is my benefit? And how much longer am I going to be receiving that? Right? Most common questions, right? Does any of that really need to be answered by, again, those highly specialized? No, again, kind of a failure in imagination and a failure in leadership at this point to think this is how we need to service this. A failure to not address and do some better service design uh, before the crisis. So Rhode Island has moved forward um, and has recently launched, right, is basically um, uh, a very simple update to its uh, workflow and process um, and its web application um, that they call the pizza tracker um, because someone's like, ah, people need a pizza tracker after doing their uh, user research. Uh, is that we need to let people know what the status of their benefit is, right? We can massive, we can improve this experience of applying and receiving the benefit and massively decrease the work on our side it takes to handle all these calls, the deluge, by just giving people information in a better form, right? This is kind of amazing. Like, I work with a lot of health and human services programs. We work with a lot of social benefits programs. Anywhere we see like a benefit application or where you interact, this tends to be a problem. Uh, I have yet to see this in any, any of the major eligibility systems. Such a just novel, like tell people where they stand vis-a-vis -vis the benefit, right? It's a much better experience. Um, another place, and I'm gonna switch states a little bit from the smallest to the largest, um, state of California, um, and switch gears a little bit to the, to the DMV. They had two problems that hit simultaneously. The first is they were trying to get real ID in place. Um, and they were also trying to, am I gonna run out of time? Oh, very close. Uh, uh, and they had to send all their workers home. So effectively overnight, they had to send their workforce home, interact with a lot more people, right? Um, how did they do this? Again, very similar pattern, right? Call center, augment the call center, 
put in place some new experiences to give people information versus via things like chatbots. Use the data that's coming in from this call center where you actually collect information to say, hey, what kind of questions are people answering, or sorry, asking? Can I answer them in a better way? Can I answer them on a website with a chatbot, with an email, with a text message, and reduce those, num those calls that are coming in and actually need to go to an agent, right? I think the lesson you should take from all of this is the teams that succeed, and we're now having precedence all over, is they're using great technology, but they're thinking like technology companies are, right? They're using the approaches that have really been pioneered to bring you the consumer web, to bring you things like Amazon.com, um, right? And bringing those in. Is it applied differently in government? Absolutely. Government is a unique and wonderful animal, um, right? And to think we're gonna apply those lessons one for one, it's not the case. But can we be working in more agile fashions? Should we be putting uh, constituents, beneficiaries at the center of our thinking? Should we be using user-centered design? Should we be using things like cloud? Absolutely, right? Embracing these methods, embracing these approaches is absolutely essential to how the most effective organizations now are approaching all these problems, right? So this is fundamentally a presentation first and foremost about leadership from a business side, how do we push forward and make technology better in our programs? Uh, there's three questions I think we should all be asking of our organization, whether you're a business or a technical leader, to be driving this change we're kind of talking about, to be fomenting it, right? Do you know what your customers want? What is it? How do we know that? I packed a lot into that question, but right, I think right, knowing what people want, absolutely essential getting your organization to understand that they need to understand first and foremost, right? To get out of the like, oh, we can't do that because of this, because of policy, because of whatever, and start to remove those barriers in order to give uh, a better experience to the folks applying. Where and how do we have friction in the experience now? And how do we get rid of it, right? Empower people to do this. Where are those friction points, right? And last, because I think the most important thing for any program uh, for any government, for any business, is when somebody needs you, it works. It shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be a high bar, but can we, uh, can, will we survive an increase in demand, right? Will we be able to respond? It's incredibly important. Uh, all important because at the end of the day, when you are empowering your organization to do sorts of things, you're also building a very resilient and reliant organization. You are building an organization that is able to change, able to move quickly, and is going to be responsive as things change. Um, right? Incredibly important. Really, we're building resilient organizations that can also deliver really impactful and uh, uh, easy to use services uh, for folks across the board. And with that, I'm gonna turn you over to Morgan Reed, who can talk about actually how he did some of this work uh, in a large state. Good morning. Thank you guys for having me. Mahalo, aloha. I'm still learning how to use those terms, so thank you for some patience. Um, so I am going to talk to you guys about how govern state governments have transformed. Although these lessons have also applied to private sector organizations, cities and counties, as a former state practitioner, uh, we'll talk about some of those. Casey talked to you about the business leader side and gave you some takeaways if you are leading an agency. If you're here in an IT position, this portion's for you. So I'm gonna try to get through those talking points and get you to your break on time. Um, so my name is Morgan Reed, and I work as an executive government advisor for Amazon Web Services. Um, I'm part of a team of former government executives that have led transformation in the public sector. My role now is to help coach government leaders through uh, their cloud adoption journey and think through things like strategy uh, and remove barriers. Anything that you interpret right now as a, um, a uh, roadblock, we're going to try to turn it into a speed bump and keep you moving forward. Um, prior to coming to AWS, I had the privilege of serving uh, as the state chief information officer for Arizona. Um, this is actually my first government job. Prior to that, I ran the global data centers for GoDaddy and Expedia. So for those of you that uh, have uh, lived in, and worked in that environment, I feel your pain. Uh, I too have a sore back from lifting too many servers. Uh, but the good news is there's a way forward. There's a way out of that business. Um, but let's start by um, talking about Mother Nature. 
Um, here on the beautiful Hawaiian Islands, um, there are some, some risks. Uh, it could be hurricanes, uh, volcanoes, for example. Um, in Arizona, we don't have either of those, uh, but in the hot summer months, we do have very large dust storms. So in July of 2011, uh, the state experienced a storm 100 miles wide, over one mile high, traveling at 40 to 50 miles an hour that lasted two hours. The result was a three-day outage to the state's largest data center. Uh, seven agencies had line of business application systems on our mainframe uh, and were down hard. So some of those had citizens lining up outside their doors, like DMV, um, to get service. Uh, this data center itself was an aging facility, a 40-year-old building, that had $15 million in deferred maintenance. That was the stuff that it needed, but they decided to postpone. And in order to get it up to current data center standards, it was going to take $30 million more. Uh, when we're competing for the same general fund dollars that pay for teachers and doctors and police, we weren't going to get that funding. Um, that's what I walked into on my first day on the job as CIO in 2015. So what we did first was establish a modern foundation. Uh, we set a cloud-first policy, but not cloud-only. We had to force the question, why can't this go in the cloud uh, now? Um, because agencies, for the longest time, had just hardware refresh auto-approved. Uh, and, and some of them, unfortunately, either didn't have the skills or didn't have the desire to look forward and answer the question, ask the question, how can we best solve this problem with modern technology? So as a decentralized federated state, or had agencies that had their own IT staff and procurement exceptions, the one thing I did have uh, as a centralized leader was policy. So we graduated our cloud-first strategy to a cloud-first policy and started working with our customers on that. The other thing we did is we trained our people to use new tools and technologies to solve government problems. Our approach was, let's use private sector technology to solve public sector problems and see how far we can get. Obviously, there's some, there's some nuance, there's some, there's some compliance, there's some additional security and audit, but if we can have financial institutions in the cloud, you guys file your taxes on TurboTax or H&R Block that are cloud, they're handling some pretty sensitive data. I learned that the CIA is handling top secret data in the cloud. So I looked at it from a government perspective and I said, why can't we? Uh, the other thing we did strategically is we migrated our colo, our, our, our core network to a colo that gave us better access to cloud providers, um, including direct connections so that we weren't relying on our internet providers. Next, we embraced cloud technology. Um, we moved our mainframe to the cloud over a period of about six months. My customers told me it was eight times faster and fully resilient. We migrated 30 on-prem email systems to one cloud-based systems with Google, became their largest government customer. We migrated 15 agent of our agency licensing and permitting systems to Salesforce and worked on that citizen-facing experience. And then when the big rock of the mainframe was out of the data center and we had a whole bunch of servers left, I told my agencies, you can go to any cloud you want, uh, but you can't buy hardware, put it in your basement, and call it private cloud, because who are we kidding? There's one thing that you will be successful at in doing that. You will train the next level of cloud administrators to go work for Amazon, Microsoft, or Google, but keeping them on a government salary, it's a hard road to hoe. Uh, I realized that when I was working at GoDaddy and Expedia, and they said, you know, let's say it out loud, we're going to compete with Amazon, Microsoft, and Google and build private cloud. Uh, neither of those were successful, and it cost a couple of VPs their jobs. So having that in the, in the rear view when I came to the state, and said, private cloud is not for government that I've seen being successful. Um, the other thing we did is we set a goal to exit the state's largest data center in 18 months um, to create that burning platform to drive uh, the organization to move faster than it otherwise would. We dedicated six months to planning and 12 months to execution. And when, I told, when my customers told me, I don't know if I can get out in time, I said, don't worry. Your servers will be there waiting for you on the sidewalk outside the building. But I am going to pull the cable to the network on December 31st. Uh, that motivated them to look for different options and try different things. And it turns out we were able to actually get exit before Thanksgiving. Because as you know, when you tell a uh, government or any employee, you might have to work through the holidays to get this done. <laughs> they find a way. So what did we learn as we went through that? Uh, we learned that governance was important because our old models of provisioning hardware um, needed to be rethought and modernized. If you tell somebody, fill out a ticket and I'll get you your cloud server in 10 days, 
when they can, you know you can just go spin it up in 15 to 60 minutes, uh, you don't want to be a blocker and get in the way of your agency customers. Second was communication was key because when folks did push back, inevitably, we had to talk them through it and explain, no, actually, the cloud is going to be faster, it is going to be cheaper, and it is going to be more secure. And in every case, we found that to be true when we, when we looked under the covers and did the deep dive. We also had to optimize our footprint, right-sizing our applications, which saved us money. Uh, one example we had was Game and Fish has an annual hunt draw when people come from all over the world to shoot things in the Arizona desert. They have to apply for their, their uh, hunting license. And the, two weeks before that draw, they log into the website, drive traffic up, and two weeks after, they log in to see if their number was called and they can start booking their trip. But the other 48 weeks a year, those servers only needed about five uh, to handle the load. During peak, they, hand, they needed 50. So they would buy 50 and run them all year long. And what we found was by moving that one application, one website and database to the cloud, they were able to save 70% and use the elasticity to scale up when they needed it and scale down and pay less when they didn't. So what we had hoped for was to get 25 to 50% in the cloud. We looked around and we couldn't find other governments that had done it. And we said, somebody's got to be first. Let's give it a try. Uh, what we ended up with, uh, I believe it was said earlier, 80% of the workloads out of that data center were moved to the public cloud. And 75% of that was with AWS. I gave my agencies options. And time and time again, AWS responded faster, moved uh, heaven and earth to get things done. And I saw the leadership principle of customer obsession in action, which is why I served my four years for Governor Ducey. I wanted to be part of an organization that ran like that. Thanks again, Kim. Um, during that cloud journey, uh, the state of Arizona saved $4 million a year. What's happened since then? Uh, agencies there have now embraced the cloud six years in. They're using the cloud native applications for all things new. They're setting up modern data lakes so they can make data-driven decisions. Like Hawaii, we're going through a re-election. There's going to be a new governor that's going to ask new questions and have new priorities. Do we have the data infrastructure to answer those? Um, modern technology is also attracting top talent from the private sector to come work in government. If you want the best and brightest, I'm sorry, but you can't sit them down in front of green screens and push paper. They're not going to stand for it. Um, AWS uh, in the state of Arizona, they're now using over 50 services across our agencies to solve different problems that match their mission. Um, they've also, as they've continued the work of moving to the cloud, shut down 87 of the remaining 90 server rooms. Uh, my former deputy, J.R. Sloan, that's now the CIO, said they're tracking $11 million annually in savings. Um, in Arizona, we did it. I know Hawaii can do it. Um, and what I close every session with is think big, start small, and go fast. Thank you.